Are you wondering what it takes to crush the toughest ACT math test ever given? If so, in this video, I'm gonna go over a sampling of a few questions that were on what I think was probably one of the hardest ACT math tests that was ever given. This is from a test a couple of years ago. ACT doesn't release all of its tests. It releases, I think, three a year. So there's three release tests a year. This is one of the toughest. Before we get into this though, if you're prepping for the ACT and you wanna to totally crush this test, we have a whole course on the ACT. I scored perfectly on the exam myself. I've prepped a student to a perfect 36. We've had many students report back that they got 35s on the exam. And we've had people report score increases of anywhere from two points to 12 points. So check it out, supertutortv.com. If you're prepping for the SAT, we also have the best SAT prep course ever. You can check that out too. Also, we have a mailing list for free, no charge, supertutortv.com slash subscribe. We'll keep you posted on everything that's awesome and exciting in our world. So a couple of years ago, I had a student who emailed me after he went to take his ACT. And this is a student, mind you, who on his practice tests was getting like 35s and 36s on the math. Like we were not worried about the math at all. He emails me right after his test and he says, Brooke, I totally bombed the math. I guessed on like four of them. Like, I feel like there's two others I was shaky on. Like, I totally think I bombed. I probably got a 30. It was so bad, I'm gonna have to retake. And then he got a score and guess what he got on the math? A 35. And he missed four questions. So that's a crazy curve. The curve was such, and I'm showing you guys the curve right now, that you could get four wrong and still get a 35. But if that tells you anything, it should tell you that this was a really stinking hard math test. So we're gonna preview a few of the questions from this math test. He went on, by the way, to super score a 36 on the exam overall, which is pretty cool. In any case, let's look at some of these hard problems. 52. At what point in the standard xy coordinate plane do the asymptotes of the function y equals this ugly thing, graph below, intersect? So one of the things that you may have learned in uh, Algebra 2 is how to track asymptotes. Obviously, there's one kind of asymptote that's really easy, and that's the kind of asymptote that's indicated by the bottom of your rational expression, which is like aka fraction, right? That x minus 3 is indicating an asymptote, and what is that asymptote? That asymptote is such that x cannot equal three, because if x equals three, that becomes zero and we have an impossible function, right? So what kind of asymptote is this? This is called a vertical asymptote, right? So vertical asymptotes are the easiest ones to know and to find. So right away, just from looking at this problem really quickly, I know that there's an asymptote at x equals three because x cannot equal three. So that means it's not f and it's not g because x has to be three, but now I'm stuck with three answer choices. Now my next tip is that when you have a problem and you can eyeball the answer, sometimes that's a better way of approaching it than approaching it the right way, okay? There are lots of ways to do problems, by the way, and I know some of you are like, oh, I already knew the answer. I just sketched it out and I already know it. And, and Brooke, you're like explaining too much and like, that's like silly. There are lots of ways to do things. I try to teach you guys as much as I can so that you can download all the information possible, learn as much as possible so that you have as many tools in your toolbox as possible when you get to the test itself. That's kind of my theory of teaching. I know there's probably other ways. If you have other ways, you're welcome to share them below. That's totally cool if you have other ways to solve this. But my thought is on this one, one of the best ways to do this is to realize there's a slant asymptote. Now, slant asymptotes are harder to keep track of. You're only going to have a slant or oblique asymptote when the top of a rational expression is exactly one degree higher than the bottom. So here you see how this turns out to be this 2x squared plus 4x. So this is what we call a second degree polynomial. What that means is that the highest like x to the power is a two. That's what a second degree polynomial means. And on the bottom here, we have a first degree polynomial because this is like x to the first power. So these are exactly one apart. When we have that one apart situation, that's when we have a slant or an oblique asymptote. Now that's a lot to memorize and it's kind of confusing and this doesn't come up on the ACT all that often. So my advice to you guys is just to eyeball it, see that, oh, there's probably an asymptote that kind of like this is approaching and this is approaching because what is an asymptote anyway? It's the line that these lines that are actually graphed approach, right? It doesn't make sense. Now, if I look at these answer choices, right? I have 10, I have 16, which is about here, and I have 31. Okay, so 31 seems pretty improbable because like even if I went like straight across at 31, that seems like it's almost gonna like 
get into that and then this this diverges so much that doesn't seem to make any sense right so i don't think 31 makes any sense so we're going to get rid of 31 but my point to you guys is i can pretty much eyeball this because i'm pretty sure that if i have it going through 10 do you guys see what i mean if this is a line why that's really far away from that one up there right this one seems safely halfway between even if you mistakenly thought it was a horizontal asymptote I don't know, like that doesn't look like an asymptote because it's not approaching it from both sides. I can understand that you maybe thought that there were three asymptotes and then maybe you could have put the 10 and the 31, but then how do you decide between them? They both look, I don't know. In any case, I can pretty much eyeball that it's gonna be the 16. And that's actually my advice for how to do this problem for most people, because you don't have a lot of time on the ACT and you don't have time to actually figure out what the asymptote is using the actual rule, which is what I'm gonna to talk to you about next. So again, when we have a second degree polynomial up top and we have a first degree down bottom and these are one apart, right? This rational expression is one apart in terms of our degrees and the polynomials. We have a slant asymptote, okay? To find out what that slant asymptote is, we have to do long division. So I'm gonna take my 2x squared plus 4x, and then I'm gonna divide it by x minus three. And then whatever we get up here is going to be the graph that I could graph here for my slant asymptote. I don't actually recommend, that, again, that you do this. I recommend that you eyeball it. Just sketch it out and eyeball it. You're going to get the same answer. And by the way, that's really good advice for really hard problems toward the end. A lot of times, if you just use logic, you're going to see only one feasible answer choice. There was actually another question that I was considering before doing this video. I was looking for other hard ACT math questions, and I saw one that was like an average rate problem. And there was one girl, and she was going two miles per hour for a while, and then she was going three miles per hour for a while, and she spent like 10 minutes doing this and five minutes doing this, and then you were supposed to find her average rate. Well, the old like fashion way to do this, this silly way that some students think you should do is just add two plus three and divide by two. Well, that's not the answer. But we do know that her average speed has to be somewhere in the range of two to three because these were her two average rates, right? So it's not gonna be more than these and it's not gonna be less than these. So we need a number in between these, right? Well, of the answer choices, there's only one answer choice that was between these on the test. And I thought, gosh, that's silly. That makes this question way too easy because you just know it has to be between two and three. And you can put that and you don't have to do any math at all. So in that same way that we have here, something you can eyeball. If you can eyeball it, eyeball it, go for it. You know, if you can use your graphing calculator to make it do all the work on a hard problem, that's super great. Make that happen. I'm going to show you the right way to do it here, just in case you want to know for your brain and furtherment in math skills, because maybe ACT will figure out that everybody could have eyeballed this and they're going to make it harder next time. Who knows? So what you would do is you do this long division and then you say X goes into 2X squared 2X times, then you multiply it out, right? You do 2X squared and then this is minus 6X. Now, don't forget we're subtracting here. So I'm going to flip the signs of these. And now I add straight down. So this is 2x squared minus 2x squared is 0x squared, so that's 0. And then these I add together and I get 10x. And then I say x goes into 10x, and that's plus 10 times. And we do 10 times x, and I put the 10x down here. And then 10 times 30 is minus 30. But I don't actually have to worry about any of this or any of the remainder or anything because I'm basically done. This is what I need. This is the graph. This is y equals 2x plus 10 is going to be my asymptote. So now if I actually wanted to solve this out, what I would do is I would take my x equals 3 and I plug it in right here and I get y equals 2 times 3 plus 10. And that gives me 16. So that's where the 16 comes from if you want to numerically solve out for it. But as you can see, it's a little bit time consuming. I've got to do this crazy little long division. Now I don't have to do the long division to the end. I don't have to worry about my remainder down here, this negative 30 that's going to be hanging out. I just have to worry about this piece because that's where my asymptote comes from. But kind of involved, we don't have slant asymptotes very often, if ever, on the ACT. This is very rare. I've maybe only seen slant asymptotes twice in my life and once was on this super hard math test, which was like the hardest ever. So there you go. There's my advice. But in any case, that's how you find it numerically. Ta-da. Hope you enjoyed that. All right. The next problem we're going to take a look at is number 54. Now, this one's kind of crazy because it's just like not what you would expect. I mean, who formats a question like this? It's kind of like weird. So hang with it. Which of the following number line graphs represents all values in the domain of the function and then we have a function, but it's a log. And it's kind of crazy because you're like, what? So I assume that all these have to be values that X could be, right? What could X be? My favorite way to deal with logs whenever I have like a logic-based question, which is what I would say this is, 
is to actually put it into regular exponent form. Again, there's other ways that you probably could do this, but this is how I think it's easiest to think about this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say 10 to the answer, right? I always like to think the exponent is the answer. Now I could also put just y here if you want. So 10 to the y is going to equal x squared minus 4x plus 3, right? So that's something I know. But here's something else I know. Whenever I have a positive integer to a power, I know what that can be, right? What the range of that function is in part, because if I have a positive number to a power, that power could be zero, that would make it one, right? That power could be fraction. If this power is a fraction, it's like taking the square root or something, so it makes it smaller, but it will never make it negative, right? So I know, and it will never make it zero. An exponent is essentially telling you to multiply stuff together. The only things that you can multiply together and get zero from have to include zero itself. So when I have some positive number to an exponential power, I know the result from this has to be positive and it can't even equal zero. So I know this has to be, if I have a zero over here, 10 to the y has to be greater than zero. So if this equals 10 to the y, then here's what I know about this. So compared to zero, right, I know this has to be greater than zero, okay? So then what I can do is kind of look over here and say, well, when is this thing greater than zero? Now, I have a couple of options. Option one is I could get out my graphing calculator and I could just graph y equals x squared minus 4x plus 3. Remember, you can always solve quadratics really fast by graphing it on your graphing calculator. And then I would say, I want to know all the times when this is greater than zero. And my guess is this is going to be a parabola and I'm going to have sort of one of two situations. Either that parabola is going to dip down for a while, right? And the y value is going to be greater than zero, right, here and here on the outsides. Or if it's an upside down parabola, it would be something like this, right? And it would be like this and this, and then this in between thing. Well, the only thing that looks like this could be dictated by a parabola would be j and k, right? This would be the outsides if it's an upward facing parabola and kind of dips below. And this would be a downward facing, or it would be all real numbers, right? Probably something like that. And so I realized it's got to be j or k, and k is the only one that makes sense because my coefficient of my x value is positive. That means it's a smiley face that faces upward, and that we learn in graph behavior. If you guys happen to be on my ACT course, I go over this stuff really extensively in graph behavior, this part of it. We also have a chapter on logs where I go over logs pretty extensively so that you can understand the relationship between all of this jazz to very quickly know that 10 to the something equals this, and also understand how domain and range play out in logarithmic function questions. In any case, here's some other ways that I could approach this, okay? If that was confusing for you. I'm going to give you guys some other outs. Another way we can look at this is by testing points. Remember, whenever you have line graphs here, if you get stuck on something and it feels really hard, you can always test a point. So what you might test here is you see how some of these have one and other ones don't. I think this one has one, right? That's the only one that includes one. So if one works, then F works. You guys get me? So that could be a really fast and easy thing to check. One squared, so I could use process of elimination, minus four plus three, and that would equal zero. And I know if 10 to the something equals zero, what did I say? It has to be greater than zero, it can't equal zero because it can't get 10 to the something equal to zero, right? I can say 10 to the zero equals one, but the only way to get zero from a multiplication problem, which is essentially what an exponent problem is, would be to have a zero in here somewhere. And I can't create a zero in 10 to the something power. So this is not going to work. So f is out. But I also know that because this does, this is sort of a hinge point here, right? Because I figured out that these equal zero when I plug in one. I know one is probably a hinge point. So I'm expecting there to be a circle at a one because I would think of that as sort of like a hinge point. So next up, what I probably would test would be maybe g and j. I could test two and see what happens when I plug in two. So I could do two squared minus eight plus three. So that's four minus eight is negative four plus three is negative one. Oh wait, you can't have 10 to the something power be a negative. That doesn't make any sense. So these ones that include two, I know are out and I can get rid of both of those. And then here I can just test zero. What happens when I plug in zero? Can I have 10 to the something equal three? Sure, I can have 10 to something equal three. That's possible, right? It's going to be fractional, yeah? Because it's gonna be smaller so that it breaks this down 
right? This has to become smaller to become three, but that's totally doable. So K makes sense, and then I pick K. So you can also do it that way by plucking points and using process of elimination. That's um, uh, something that I really like to do whenever I have inequalities problems. So I like to say that this problem is kind of a nexus. What makes it so challenging is that it's an overlap of multiple different kinds of mathematics that have all coalesced into this single problem. And these are all, by the way, chapters and slash videos that we have on our online course. So if you guys are on that course, you can go check out the related videos. It has logarithms. It has inequalities. It has quadratics and graph behavior. So all of that works into this problem. Lots to think about, a little bit of exponents and theory and exponents. So lots of different math types that have all converged. And that's what makes it a little bit challenging. But anyhow, not too bad, right? You can also do it that second way. In any case, whatever works for you works. And there's probably multiple other ways to do this too. You could probably even graph this in your graphing calculator. You could just get out your calculator, put in log base 10 and this. You could do it that way too. So for those of you that are like, Brooke, I could just get out my graphing calculator and make my graphing calculator do it. Yeah, you probably could. Some people get confused when they're graphing logs with graphing calculators though, and occasionally it does create problems. So I always like to try to figure things out in a way that like is logical as well and show you how to do it with a calculator, without a calculator. You could always crutch on your calculator. And I love crushing on my calculator. I'm probably gonna tell you guys to do that in the next one too. Okay, we'll try one more. What is the minimum value of this function for each set of positive real numbers, h, k, and q? Now this looks really hard but let's use our logic mindset, okay? Whenever I have something in absolute values, I know something really important about that, that this is always positive. So I have something always positive or zero, okay? At the, at the that's, that's what this has to turn into, something positive or zero. And then I'm gonna subtract Q from it. And then that's what my Y basically equals, or my F of X equals. So if I want the minimum value, remember whenever we ask for minimum value, it's almost always asking that of the range or the Y value, okay? The minimum value is always a y value. So I want to know what's the smallest I can make the y value. Well, zero or positive, what's the smallest that could be? The smallest that could be is a zero, right? And then q, what happens when I do zero minus q? What happens? I take my zero and then I lower it q by q. So let's pretend the q is like four, right? Let's say we have this graph here. This is like so it's like the graph of a parabola and then it's absolute valued. So it looks something like that because that would be a parabola and then it bounces up. So here, if I'm gonna lower this by Q, I'm gonna take the lowest point here and I'm gonna lower it by Q, right? And then that's gonna create a new lower value. And so if this is Q, then in terms of my Y value, that's the smallest Y value, it's just negative Q, right? And that's it. So this is actually a really simple question, but it's really confusing looking. But if you can really quickly figure out what's going on with those absolute value signs, you can do this pretty efficiently and it's not so bad. Could you do this in a graphing calculator? Sure. You could literally just make up a value for H and for K and for Q and then get out your calculator. The ABS function, by the way, is in your math. If you have a TI-84 series, which is my favorite calculator to use on this test, you can find it in the math menu. You can find ABS, it's usually all caps, ABS. And that creates an absolute value, so you can use that when you graph. And you can try to graph this and you can make up numbers for this and then see what happens minimum value wise. And I think you will find what it is, but that would be a more time consuming way to do it. So it's good to figure out the way. So those of you that were critics that told me up here, Brooke, you could just enter in your graphing calculator and be so fast. What I say to you is on this one, you can't just enter in your graphing calculator and doing so is actually slower. So it's good to know both ways to do it. My best plan of attack on the math section is to have as many ways as possible and then try to, with yourself, figure out which one you understand well enough and confidently enough to do quickly. And feel free to make shortcuts. Feel free to just jump the gun and estimate it, eyeball it when it's appropriate. Look at your answer choices, right? Be smart, work backwards, do all that good stuff. And hopefully you guys can hack this test. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. We have lots more videos here on supertutortv.com. You can also find us on Facebook, find us on Twitter, find us on Instagram, and stay plugged in. I hope you crush the ACT. Let us know how you do, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.